Security alerts and threats of terror attacks as well as armed conflicts have made the headlines since the beginning of the past week. The threat of insecurity hovers around the continent despite immense efforts to curtail the activities of terror groups in Africa. Countries in the Sahel region like Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Chad, Mali, Niger and Nigeria have all fallen victim to extremist activities. Here's a glimpse of what the headlines looked like. One, Nigerian troops neutralized seven suspected Boko Haram insurgents in Kaduna. Also, there is the headline about how kidnapped French Australian conservation, conservationists regains freedom in Chad. And then one from Burkina Faso, which says that 15 soldiers and volunteers uh, in the Goma province of Burkina Faso were killed. Well, now that I have your attention, you're welcome to Village Square Africa. I'm Kemeni Amano. Thanks for staying with us on the program. Now, the insurgency is beginning to pour over into countries below the Sahel, like Togo and Ghana, threatening to destabilize them. But the threat is much more than regional. Now, since 2016, the South African government has been on its toes over possible attacks brimming over from Mozambique, a country that has been pummeled by ISIS activities. Now, last week, the UK and US issued terror alerts over South Africa and Nigeria, warning of heightened terror attacks. These events have got us talking and questioning our security. So today on The Square, we take another keen look at security events on the continent. And with me to discuss these are Dennis Amakri, his former DSS director and security consultant. We also have Professor John Strimlaw, uh, who is uh, honorary professor of international relations at the University of Vitavatisrand, Vitavatisrand, I beg your pardon, in Johannesburg, Johannesburg, South Africa. And then from Ghana, we have Dr. Adam Bonner, executive director of the Institute of Security Safety uh, Policy Research. You're welcome to the square, gentlemen. Thank you so much for your company. Now, I'm going to start with you. Um, Adam, Adam, on this subject. Uh, Dr. Bonner, tell us, in terms of intelligence gathering on the continent, how would you assess our efforts? Well, my understanding is that we do not have um, Dr. Bonner yet, but we do have Professor Stremlaw. So let's talk about the diplomacy of security. Um, Dr. Professor Stremlaw, tell us, uh, based on what you know, as far as diplomatic relations are concerned, how would you rate how the information about the security uh, alerts were divulged by the US and the UK? Well, thank you for inviting me to say a few words, but let me just say at the outset that both Dennis and Adam are security experts, and I am not. I'm an honorary professor in international relations. I tend to look upon this in political terms primarily, and in the case of South Africa, there is a very sensitive political moment here South Africans don't want to be or appear to be, especially our leader, Cyril Ramaphosa, bullied by the United States. And they, he complained uh, openly, as did his deputy minister of home security, about the U.S. not giving details of the terrorist threat, which uh, they announced as uh, one in Nigeria and one here for this past weekend. Now, we're very glad that nothing happened, uh, but uh, we don't know what the risks really were. Joe Biden is facing a very, very, very important election next week. And the last thing he could afford was to be seen as not being attentive to the Americans who may or may not be at risk. So he would err on the side of caution. The terrorists, meanwhile, seem to be focused in, as you said at the outset, West Africa and in the Sahel. And although we have a problem in nearby Mozambique, there is not much of a problem here in South Africa so far. We don't know what um, this, this gay parade that was in Santon this weekend might have been targeted for. But terrorists like to have uh, uh, the, the, the signals go out and then they see what the response is, and you can only cry wolf so many times, and people will get tired of it. So 
it, it's, it's a tricky business. But the last point I just want to make is that South Africa is often accused of being a financial uh, hub for terrorists on the continent. It launders money. Uh, it has a very developed banking system, but it uh, does not uh, shy away from, uh, uh, so far, from illicit financial flows. And one of the debates that we're having down here is, should the illicit financial flows be more uh, of a focus? That would have a knock-on effect to terrorism in the region, I think. Mm -hmm. But it's a very technical field. We'll, we'll come back to, you know, the last bit of your submission. But I want us to look at uh, the way information flowed between the UK and US through a diplomatic lens. And so tell us, what would be the standard if the UK were to share, you know, or the US were to share information with its counterparts like in South Africa or in, uh, in Nigeria? You mean the standards of, of, of what constitutes a, a threat? The, 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 the U.S. Embassy here, and I assume in, uh, in uh, Abuja, uh, did not give any details of the nature of the threat. There are working relations, and Ned Price, the State Department uh, spokesman earlier today, said that we consider both Nigeria and uh, South Africa, I could also add Ghana, as important partners of the United States, close partners of the United States. And, and uh, you know, one of the things that we have in common is we're all aspiring democracies, and we are messy, and we're also flawed in our democracies, and the U.S. has got some very real problems confronting it right now, and it's heavily polarized. And I don't think that it's in Africa's interest to see Donald Trump come back, for example. So uh, Joe Biden was probably um, both uh, overly cautious and not very specific, but he also uh, has good friends in Accra, in Abuja, and in uh, Johannesburg uh, or Swanee and, and Cape Town who don't want to see uh, a, another round of, of, uh, of Donald Trump or Trump supporters and the isolationists and nationalists that they, and racists that they uh, represent. Now, Prof, I'm going to come back to you about what are the best practices in sharing um, information such as this. But uh, Dr. Adam Bonner has joined uh, the conversation this time over the phone from uh, Ghana. Uh, many thanks for uh, staying on with us, uh, Dr. Bonner. Thank you for having me. Uh, Wonderful, I do have you. Now, we move the conversation a bit ahead. We've been talking about intel sharing. From your perspective as a security <laughs> uh, analyst, uh, tell us what you think about how um, the U.S., the U.K. government shared information in the last uh, few weeks. Well, yes, thank you very much, Kenny, and, uh, you know, uh, Good evening to your viewers and the other, the other panelists on the other side. I must say it's a shame uh, looking at the size of Nigeria and the resource, you know, the resources available to Nigeria, both human and material. And yet dealing with this insurgency uh, looks to be something that is too far away from, you know, the whole world. You, there is no way any person in his right frame of mind would want to discount, uh, you know, Nigeria. And so for the whole world to have watched on, literally, for Abuja to be encircled, tells you that, uh, you know, in as much as I would want to say the world could have done better, but I would want to say, without any fear of any equivocation, that the leaders of Nigeria uh, are very complicit in what we are seeing in Nigeria. Because then if you have a country that is as big as Nigeria, with all the resources and insurgency in Nigeria, and you have Nigeria having one of the largest military mines in, you know, in, in, in black Africa, look at the number of soldiers and look at the training soldiers must go through to be called uh, a soldier. And you have insurgency 
in Nigeria and it's difficult to fight this insurgency and terrorism in Nigeria. And so I would say that uh, the call by the U.S. State you know, Department that non-essential staff should start departing Nigeria, you know, Abuja to the specific and the U.K. and all that, I would say that this has always been coming. And it has always been this way, and I would have wished that uh, the friendly nations like the U.S., you know, Britain, and, and the other countries that are a bit more friendlier to, uh, you know, Nigeria, Ghana, and some other countries should have acted swiftly with, you know, intelligent sharing. But it is difficult when you have state complicity, because then I call some of these people com conflict preneurs. Uh, so long as the war continues, so long as the conflict thrives, people tend to benefit. And in a situation like that, enemy, it becomes very difficult to counter the insurgency we are seeing. And you can just imagine Abuja mm -hmm. being, uh, you know, surrounded. It, it's a shame. And I think but that a lot would have to be done starting with Asorok, those who are Inhabiting the place. Dr. Bonner, we'll get, we'll get into the, the conversation of what needs to be done. But right now, let me just introduce you our chat today at the square, uh, Dennis Amakri. Uh, Dennis is uh, joining us um, as former uh, DSS director and security consultant. Good evening to you, Dennis, and many thanks for your time. But I'm taking the conversation now to, to your doorstep. Um, Adam has made mention of in intelligence sharing. Um, as a former, former DSS director, how would this kind of information have reached you before the public? Uh, well, um, the information sharing is a common thing among uh, the intelligence community. And uh, I know very well that uh, when I was in service, uh, we shared information with... Uh, even uh, foreign foreign intelligence agencies, uh, foreign uh, diplomatic agencies, and uh, of course, let's refocus because this particular information that is causing all the panic all over the place was originally from the DSS. You know, if you remember very well, two weeks ago, you know, they came out and said that look, people should be very very. Uh, careful because there might be some terrorist activities. And actually, um, I am very sure that uh, the other embassies have also taken up on that. And uh, they feel that the intelligence was credible and reliable. And um, if there is going to be imminent violence, then they have to alert their citizens. Right. And that was Dennis, just, just allow me to gain clarity here. Um, you're saying yes. that the DSS alert that came weeks before um, the UK, US alert, to the best of your knowledge, are referring to the same things. Of course. Go back and verify. You can check uh, all the newspapers or... In fact, if um, I don't have it right available with me right now, send it to you, uh, where the uh, spokesman of the DSS, uh, Dr. Peter Afonaya, sent out the security alert about Abuja about two weeks ago, something around two weeks. And if you check newspapers, you'll see it. So it is not, it's nothing new. Um, and of course, when information like this come out, you share it with the diplomatic uh, corps, you also share it with foreign intelligence agencies, just like they do with us too. So I think we have to refocus this because a lot of people have misunderstood it and then of course interpret it, some are panicking and all the rest. So I, I just want us to look closely at the alert itself that we got from the UK and US. And now you are sharing with us that it is the same alert that was issued earlier by uh, the DSS here in Nigeria. The alert talked about, um, it, it does not talk about eminent at an, an imminent attack, but you know, we all threw ourselves into the frenzy. As security people, and Dennis, I'm starting with you, uh, 
what reading, what understanding did you make of uh, the letter? There is nothing um, uh, uh, very, very uh, difficult or uh, ununderstandable about it. Alerts are usually sent out to the public. Now, this particular one, I should say, is a worded message from the United States Embassy. And it was actually directed to the U.S. citizens in Nigeria, not to the whole Nigerian public. And then, of course, um, the one that the DSS sent out to um, everybody in, um, uh, in the country was to be very, very aware that uh, there might be terrorist activity. And then, of course, people should be situationally aware about where they are or, you know, not go and get themselves involved in big gatherings and stuff like that. So when a lot like this comes out, it's basically to make people aware and uh, nothing else. Now, uh, Dr. Bonner, what will be your perspective on this? Did we throw ourselves into an overdrive? Hello, Dr. Bonner, can you hear me? Every now and then. Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me too? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay, so I, so I hold the view that uh, this could have been prevented, even though I do admit that every now and then, uh, you know, countries in the West would issue alerts, uh, you know, in, in various forms to several, you know, other countries apart from themselves. And so it's nothing new. But mine is that if you look at the, the insurgency in Nigeria, and for that matter, uh, Abuja has come under some terror attacks in previous years, in previous periods. Uh, it is safe to say that uh, it doesn't matter if this is nothing new or not. This could have been prevented using what I, I call, uh, you know, intelligence sharing. Uh, at, at what point did the Western countries, and the moment this could figure, uh, remember, you know, the international community attention is shifted to that particular country. And we are discussing this because you have... Some other, uh, you know, the U.S. and probably others have issued terror alert, a possible terror alert in, in Abuja, the political capital of Nigeria. So mine is that, uh, couldn't this have been presented? Yeah, I do understand. My colleague on the other side, uh, the former DSS uh, officer, yes, I do understand that this is nothing new, but it shouldn't be happening. I would say that it should not be happening uh, Dr. Bona, what shouldn't be happening? I'm not sure I got that right. What what do you say what, what shouldn't mean, be happening? What, what I mean is that what I mean is that fighting terrorism in a country like Nigeria, preventing alerts from some of you know uh, Western countries into areas like Abuja is something that are preventable. At the moment, it almost looks like the world's attention has been shifted to Nigeria, for that matter, uh, Abuja, not for the right reason, but for, you know, possible terror attacks in Abuja. And I find that uh, not, you know, not too good. How much information did they share with the, the federal government of Nigeria? Did they, did before the State Department issued the alert, did they sit with, you know, the federal government of Nigeria? Did they sit with the chief of the defense staff, the IGP, and the rest, the, 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 the Security Council of Nigeria, did they sit with them? Because obviously, this obviously has some negative or a lot of negative connotations dealing with Nigeria. And you know that still over uh, into, you know, the other, the sub region. In, in, and so mine is that uh, I'm expecting that the, the, the leader, the powers that be, uh, should as much as possible do what they can to bring down this insurgency 
in, in Nigeria. So that and, and some action is being taken. I'd like us to look at uh, some of those actions in a bit. But let, let's take it back to South Africa with uh, Professor Stremler. Professor, uh, earlier I was asking you about um, President Cyril Ramaphosa did mention uh, his disappointment with how the, these uh, alerts were issued by his counterpart government in the UK and the US. He more or less told us that his government was unaware of any kind of engagement with, on, on the diplomatic level. Uh, how do you uh, measure that kind of uh, situation in terms of shouldn't the UK be talking to the South African government if something of this nature is to happen? I'm not quite sure I, I know how to answer that, except that I do think that Dr. Bono was rightly pointing out that this is nothing new. But in fact, in South Africa, there is not an indigenous terrorist threat or uh, of, of, uh, of association uh, that is, is afflicting Nigeria. And uh, that Nigerian problem is very, very different from what we have or may have allegedly uh, at risk this past weekend here in South Africa. Cyril Ramaphosa is politically very sensitive to the appearance of being ordered around by the United States. It, we, we are very defensive about our sovereignty, and he felt that he had to say something. But if you note very carefully, he did not attack Joe Biden. He was meeting with Joe Biden in... Um, in uh, uh, Washington in September, and they had a very, very good meeting. And that before that, in, in August, the, the Secretary of State was here in Nigeria, and they had very productive meetings. And then the Deputy Secretary of State was here uh, a month earlier, and that also were very good meetings. And so what they're trying to do is to stabilize the relationship at a time when Ukraine is stressing or is seen by some politicians to stress the dependence of, of, uh, of, of the U.S. on that issue and not make it uh, a deal breaker in the U.S.-South uh, African relationship. That's very different from the problems that afflict Nigeria. And I go back 50 years since I did a book on the Nigerian Civil War when I know that the security of Nigeria was at profound risk and was held together very uh, ably by Yakub Ogawan's uh, administration, and he was a young guy then. And uh, it, it, um, it, is, it is a shame that, and as, I, as that Dr. Bona rightly pointed out, that these insurgents have been allowed to run roughshod over Nigeria, but I wouldn't prescribe anything for Nigeria. I can just say that South Africa is a different case. Mm. While we're on the case of South Africa, you mentioned earlier about how it would seem that uh, South Africa is becoming a financial hub for terrorist cash. What are the international implications for the country if it does not do anything about this? Yes, it has very profound implications. And what we are trying to recover from is a period of state capture under uh, former President Jacob Zuma when they gutted the finance ministry, or tried to, and the um, South African Revenue Service and the checks on illicit financial flows because a lot of money was being uh, corruptly uh, sent abroad by ministers and uh, other high-ranking officials who were in on the take for uh, primarily for, for public tenders uh, that uh, amounted to one and a $0.3 trillion a year. So it's a lot, a lot of money. And what Ramaphosa faces, and he's got a very fragile coalition backing him right now, and it'll be tested next month, is a trying to, trying to restore the integrity. And one of the arguments that I will make as a result of this interview uh, here is that the rest of Africa depends on a reliable financial hub that is not abetting and aiding financial flows to terrorist groups around the continent. But that's a very tricky and very technical problem on which the Americans and the South Africans and the British and the Nigerians can all cooperate and, and share information. But you know, the complications in the Nigerian uh, South African relationship 
begs for a closer relationship as we had during Thabo Mbeki's administration with President Obasanjo. So, um, you know, there's a lot of work to be done on a lot of fronts, and I don't mean to confuse this answer, but I do think that you do have to distinguish between the security situation in Nigeria that Dr. Bono has referred to and down here. All right, Professor Stremler, I'm going to say thank you at this point for joining our conversation with, you know, the international relations perspective and some insight from South Africa. I do appreciate your company tonight. Uh, you're still watching Village Square Africa with me, Kemini Amano. We have been talking about the security alerts and security situation um, on the continent uh, the last few weeks. We've talked about Nigeria, Ghana, and South Africa. Now we want to talk about the movement of the insurgency and how it is moving below the Sahel region and the threats that it poses to countries like Ghana and Togo. We would also look at uh, how President Muhammadu Buhari met with his security couples earlier today. Stay with us here. Welcome back to The Square. Still with me here talking about Africa security, uh, Dennis Amakri, he's former DSS director, and Dr. Adam Bona, who is also um, a security analyst now um, from Ghana, really. Now, let me take the conversation to Dennis. Dennis, I apologize. I have kept you quiet for uh, quite a while. Now, today, uh, despite all that you have told us about the similarities between the security alerts, uh, the president, uh, Muhammad Buhari, met with his security capos today. What do you think about that action? Tell us. Uh, well, um, you know that uh, they have been having uh, regular meetings. Uh, the president has been calling the chief of uh, uh, service chiefs and be having meetings with them. And I think it was necessary because apparently this last alert from the United States um, uh, unsettled everybody because um, it was roughly handled. Many people didn't uh, recognize it for what it was uh, as an alert that has already been in the public domain. Uh, so there was need to sit down and put heads together and then, of course, look at the general um, uh, uh, approach on dealing with uh, the insurgency and terrorist case in Nigeria. Now, um, like uh, the professor said from uh, South Africa, uh, there is this um, insurgency that has been allowed to fester for so long in Nigeria. And I think that's not giving uh, Nigeria a very good name. But at the same time, um, we have to decisively, you know, deal with it. Because when you look at it, uh, service chiefs have been changed about uh, twice now, and then, of course, um, uh, we've uh, recorded some kind of um, uh, succor from uh, the new people that have been there, and um, that, that, that's okay, but I don't think that is good enough because we cannot be executing a, a war or an insurgency for more than 10 years, you know, so... I think those are the things, and then the president has said uh -huh. that he wants this thing to go away before he leaves. So we'll, we'll watch him. I, I, well, it, it might take a miracle considering the general elections are just around the corner. We look forward to that miracle. But uh, tell us, as former DSS uh, director, what were some of your challenges in dealing with issues of this matter? For which reason we are still plagued by insurgency in, in a country like Nigeria? Well, um, it is not only for Nigeria, but... Um, I think basically along uh, the whole of West Africa, uh, the West Africa sub-region, uh, the intelligence agencies are operating, and then of course you have the police working with them, you have the military also working with them, but it was observed that starting from all the way from Burkina Faso, Mali, all the way down to Ghana, Nigeria, Niger, Chad, 
you know, the security agencies were working in silos. They were working in silos, that's number one. And then the different countries are not synergizing because fighting terrorism is an international effort, you know, and we expected, and they, well, they've come up with the joint uh, uh, multinational tax force that has been fighting mm -hmm. uh, Boko Haram and uh, ISWAP in West Africa. But um, I don't think they are doing enough because some countries are not contributing their due quota uh, to fight this particular war. So these are the hitches whereby we don't have a concerted effort to fight um, terror itself. I see. Now, um, what more do you need? A and by you, I mean, what more do officers who are in your pos the position you used to occupy need in order to deal with this effectively? Uh, well, um, I can tell you for one that uh, the officers there are very happy right now because uh, we've I, I, I know that they've been given new equipment to deal with. Uh, they, they've been uh, more kitted. Uh, their welfare has been taken care of. Uh, so uh, these are the basic issues with uh, security forces. If you can uh, take care of their welfare and then, of course, um, uh, give them brand new kitting. And then, of course, we're in the age of technology right now. So uh, if um, the technology, the latest technologies that uh, require, are required for operations are in their hands, I think they will do a fantastic job. Because I know... Indeed. Now, I'm going to come back to you in a bit, Dennis. So let, let's, let's keep uh, Dr. Bonar active right now. Do Dr. Bonar, I, I see you have joined us on Zoom now. I appreciate that. Let's talk about the movement of the insurgency. We have seen it come uh, down to Burkina Faso. Uh, we've seen it threaten Togo. Ghana has always been on its toes. You and I have had conversations uh, about it. But... What would you say has been the behavior of insurgency traveling across West Africa? Oh, yes. Uh, thank you for having me back. The behavior has been, if you ask me, very fluid. So they are well interconnected. And uh, I, if I had my colleague who used to be a former uh, DSS uh, director, uh, he mentioned... Uh, you know, welfare of officers. He mentioned the fact that they have new accoutrements, i.e., uh, you know, kits and all that. Uh, but uh, from the way, you know, call it the leaders in, in this part of the world attempt to fight terrorism itself, contribute to, you know, helping uh, those who sponsor terrorism. You can, I mean, I'm not saying that uh, their welfare is not needed. I'm not saying they don't need uh, kits and all that. It's very important, especially if you take the reason why Burkina Faso, uh, you know, there is counter -coup, coups and counter coups is because the military feels their welfare has not been taken care of. But in the specific case of Nigeria, I think that, yes, it is important to provide all this you know, tools and equipment and technology. But then that speaks directly to why the, the conflict, the insurgency is, in, is, is still going on in Nigeria because the moment you talk about pulling military, you talk about procurement. So it is in somebody's interest to ensure that uh, the conflict continues so that so the supply chain can keep running. Mine is that the, the professor, the good old professor in South Africa mentioned you have a lot of looted cash from Nigeria and some West African countries that have ended up in several other countries. In fact, several other countries. How is the coordinated effort at making sure that those who are benefiting from the loot in Nigeria and other countries and buying properties all over the world, Dubai, in South Africa, and in some cases, even in Ghana and all that, how are the... 
Well, well, uh, uh, Dr. Paul, how, how do we, how do, how do you uh, know this? That you know those complicit in the the insurgency here in Nigeria are financially benefiting. How are you linking the wealth of people to the insurgency? Well, I'm linking that to it. You know, even in the case of Nigeria, literature is abound. It's everywhere that previous government under some regimes. Some people over procured or took money and didn't supply what was needed. And it is anyone who understands the history of conflict and insurgency and crimes. There is always somebody in there who is benefiting. And I call them the conflict preneurs. They are they insist to ensure that so long as the, con the, the conflict continues, the, the supply chain is, is oiled and fuel. And so I am saying this without any fear that if the Nigerian government wants to fight insurgency, it should look within Asorok itself, look within the military hierarchy, look within the police hierarchy, look within the governors who are dotted around the various states where this insurgency is thriving, and find out, are they, are some of them complicit? You might not find all of them, but you see, that will be the first step in fighting insurgency. And I call that a non-military solution a non-military solution because then you go behind and then act laws to ensure that if you were caught for probably benefiting from a particular conflict or the insurgency in Nigeria, you will be treated like an, insur like an insurgent because then uh, in, in you should be tried probably with high treason so that if you are convicted, what does it say in Nigeria if you are tried with an offense set up, such as high treason. But until that is done, Kemeni, well, I will tell you that what we are seeing in Nigeria is going to go on because then uh, someone has to procure, you know, uh, jet fighters. Somebody has to procure machine guns, bullets, you know, accoutrement to, to fight insurgency. Dr. Bonner, to, so to be fair to the administration, um, we have also I, seen not only rehabilitation, but we have also seen prosecution of some people who were arrested and, and charged with terror activities in the country. So yes, some, some activity is going on um, to, to deal with you know, these things the way you have said. But I, I'll bring it back to Dennis. Are there people profiting from uh, you know, the, the insurgency here in, in Nigeria? Well, um, I don't want to, uh, well, well, we're talking about Nigeria now, that's why. Otherwise, uh, war economy is a very, very lucrative economy anywhere in the world. Even if the United States is fighting, Afga fighting in Afghanistan, that's a very booming, booming economy. Yeah. Because during okay. war, a lot of things. The supply chain is very, very, uh, is bubbling, whereby you see uh, trade going on. You know, look at the insurgency in, even in the northeast of uh, Nigeria. Uh, when you see Boko Haram uh, fighters going into a town with 200 motorbikes to go there and then, of course, burn down houses, rustle cattle, and all the rest. Uh, but nobody think of who supply the petrol that you use in those motorbikes. You know, you. those are the kinds of things. Uh, they take hostages. Who are the people that are giving them water, food, all the rest? You, you know, we've had situations where even doctors were invited to come and uh, treat wounded or sick uh, 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 terrorists. So it's a booming economy. It's a very, very booming economy. I know that, like you said, earlier said, uh, there was a general that was even caught with about 400, 000, uh, 400 million, million naira. And of course, he was jailed. Right now, he's serving his jail term. But, you know, that is just one. How many have gone away with it? Thank you. How many have run away out of the country? How many have gone to uh, foreign countries? Uh, to go and uh, uh, settle. So corruption is a major issue, not only in Nigeria, but across West Africa, you know, uh, uh, Burkina Faso, Mali, Ghana, 
everywhere, Chad. So if we can crush that demon of corruption in Africa, I think it's going to, you know, uh, give us a better future. But uh, this is a sickness that is uh, cuts across uh, the whole uh, spectrum. Now, I, I want to ask now, Dr. Bona, what are some of the lessons that, you know, the likes of Ghana and Togo could draw from, you know, Nigeria, Mali, and, and the rest in the Sahel? Well, don't, don't allow terrorism to fester in your country. Don't allow, you know, people to benefit from terrorism and get the whole country involved. There should be transparency you know, at the, at the highest level of leadership in, in these countries. Because then you usually would have, uh, you know, that certain things in security are not supposed to be discussed. And therefore, once they are not supposed to be put out there, what it means is that the public doesn't usually have knowledge of how many you are paying for bullets, how many you are paying for ammo tanks and all that. But these are things that I would want those of us within the the sub-region, those of us within the Commonwealth of West Africa and, and, the, and, and Africa at large, we need to begin to interrogate some of these things. Probably in this part of, I mean, in Ghana, we have tried as much as possible uh, to put our leaders on their toes. We want to know everything. If you don't tell us, we would find out and put it out there. And so I would want to see uh, my colleagues in Nigeria who work within the security space to start, you know, uh, putting these things before their leaders and letting them know that we won't let you get away with it. Nigerians, uh, the election, general elections is just, uh, call it, uh, not too, is, is going to take place probably shortly. And so it is in somebody's interest to put Abuja and the entire Nigeria on high alert. Probably it is going to help somebody to win an election. These are the types of corruption that uh, should stop. And I would say Ghana, Burkina, all of the other countries have had this type of insurgency. Ghana, I wouldn't say for some reasons, uh, Ghana is still intact. But that is not to say uh, nothing is going to happen if we fall asleep. But Nigeria is too important a country. It's too important a country to be, you know, to come under these types of uh, insurgency. And the West, the ECOWAS, the AU, and probably Nigerian leaders, all of them are complicit. Our, our president, Nanadu, used to be the ECOWAS uh, leader most recently. And this insurgency continued. Right. We now, have the ECOWAS office in uh, Abuja. And so if Abuja comes under fire, it means that the whole of West Africa comes under fire. And yet, mm -hmm. we haven't had ECOWAS say anything. We haven't had leaders say anything. As if this is just a Nigerian thing, leave it. For I, them I'm to glad go. you went yes, there. I'm glad possible. you went there, and I'm hoping we can uh, you, we can spend the last five minutes on the program today on uh, regional and continental efforts at helping some of these countries that are really pummeled by Islamist ex extremist activities. Uh, you mentioned ECOWAS. Uh, let me start with you, Dennis. What would be your assessment of the effort that ECOWAS has given countries like Nigeria and, you know, Mali and the likes? Um, I believe strongly that um, there is something missing among ECOWAS leaders. Um, and, uh, of course, African Union. Because, uh, you know, they have this peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, uh, 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 what do they call it now, where they, they, they try, uh, they, they review each other, you know, and um, supposed to come up with uh, uh, a face-to-face -face kind of a review to tell people, look, this is where you're wrong and this is where you're doing well and stuff like that. A, you brought that up and it never worked. ECOWAS itself, um, when this thing started, as security uh, professionals, we raised the issue in Nigeria when it, re when it started in Mali. Mm -hmm. Because we know that um, if you look at history, when the uh, insurgencies or military coups, for one, start from uh, Mali, they go all the way down to Guinea, Sierra Leone, 
uh, Ivory Coast or it will go up to Ghana. Right. Uh, now, Nigeria. I apologize for rushing you, but what do you think is missing? And why do you think the efforts that the regional blocs have put in so far have, have not worked? I think they are not very sincere about the whole thing. You know, what they could do is to go ahead and address those fundamental root causes of poverty, unemployment, and, of course, uh, what is happening in their countries. Now, if they don't address those things, West Africa will continue to remain as a recruiting ground for terrorism, you know, and, of course, the poverty that uh, exists in that sub-region um, will, will one day, you know, when people Very will rise, off. do certain things. Indeed. Now, Dr. Bona, I I'd ask you the same questions. Why have the regional efforts not worked? Or perhaps, if in your opinion, they have worked. Why are they working? Well, it hasn't worked. It hasn't worked because we literally have corrupt leaders in the sub-region. Let's put it pure, you know, straight and simple. We have leaders who are so corrupt, and therefore, how, how possible is it, it is for a corrupt leader to check uh, another corrupt leader? And so if you come to, I mean, in the West African sub-region, the West Coast, you will largely have corrupt leaders from one country to the other. And so long as we have these corrupt leaders, it is in, it's in their own interest to, you know, create chaotic countries and leave them behind because the more chaotic the country is as they left it, it becomes difficult to investigate them as they've left. And so as far as I'm concerned, it hasn't worked. And if you are in Ghana and they are here for an ECOWAS meeting, roads, streets, highways are blocked. For what? They are blocked because you have corrupt leaders meeting and coming to discuss issues of insurgency. They only come, dine, eat, and you know, waste money, the taxpayers' money, and go back to their various countries. And as they go, they seem to probably fuel the insurgency. My other colleague, the DSS uh, former director, he spoke about it. Look at the, you know, call it unemployment in the sub-region. Mm -hmm. Look at you, the average West African is below 40 years old. That is prime of any young persons, uh, you know, the working class. But unfortunately... But, but gentlemen, China, again, uh, let me remind you... May I remind you, gentlemen, that these regional blocs, including, uh, you know, the continental uh, umbrella for all countries, the AU, have formed task force that have been in some of these countries doing their best. Are you saying, Dennis, that this isn't enough? How can it be enough when the fundamental issue has not been taken care of? You know, and you find out that... Uh, Remember, remember what happened in uh, Mali uh, about a year ago when um, they, they, they had the uh, coup and then, of course, the former president of Nigeria was sent over to go and talk to the coup guys, you know. And, of course, many people didn't read it, but the, 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 the soldiers told him to go back to his country and go and solve the problem there instead of coming to disturb them here. And that is the that's the situation we find ourselves. Right. You know. We've, we've got a few minutes to go, and and, and 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 Dr. Bona, I'm going to come to you with this. Give some advice to our leaders, um, so to speak. Well, I I would want our leaders to involve the ordinary citizens in fighting insurgency. They should they should ensure that they create the enabling environment. So that uh, call it insurgency cannot thrive. I would urge our leaders to do away with their corrupt practices. And until then, uh, it is going to be very difficult. And so uh, there are two things. They either do it that way or the insurgency is going to, you know, right. sweep all of us in, in the West Coast. And so as far as I'm concerned, uh, this issue in Nigeria is just a tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. It's spreading very fast. And so we cannot continue to live in our various silos or various cells. I think they should come together. I haven't had any of the West African countries uh, speaking against what is happening and what they can do. I haven't had them. And I worry because then uh, how are we going to live 
you know, this way and saying that it's your problem. Deal with it. When we know that, especially when you take Ghana, look at someone like uh, Alassane Ouattara. He changed right. the constitution to, to stay in office. So when you have leaders like that, you know, in the West Coast, then insurgency will try. Dennis, so Dennis, brief are some of the things I want to see. Right. Dennis, briefly take us home. Um, what will be the one thing, based on your experience, that you'll be telling the Nigerian government right now? Well, uh, just like Dr. Bona said, um, you know, um, let them deal with the issue of corruption. But uh, you know, you and I know that uh, it's very difficult for anybody who is corrupt to even agree that he's corrupt. But what they could do is to please look at the issues of poverty, unemployment, provision of, you know, basic infrastructures. Because if they don't do that, they will be riding the back of the tiger. So, Dennis, here's my last one for you. Do you think that the current administration in Nigeria will be able to do anything concrete to stop the insurgency before they take leave of us? We are watching. We are we watching. Hope they do. Thank yes, you so much for your do. time, gentlemen. I yes. appreciate uh, your insight tonight here at the Square. Adam Bona is um, a security analyst. He's been joining us on the conversation from Ghana. Dennis Amakri is a former DSS director. Earlier, there was Professor John Stremler, uh, who also joined us from South Africa. I appreciate your time so much, gentlemen. And, and to you, thank you so much for your company on the program today. We'll see you same time tomorrow. Goodbye.